All right, today we're here with Andy Thomas. He's a research assistant professor with Plant Sciences and Technology Division, but stationed here at the Southwest Center Research Education Extension Center. And you've been here for 27 years? 27 years, yes. Oh my goodness, but one of the big exciting projects, you've got a lot of exciting projects, but elderberries. And elderberries are native to Missouri. But tell us a lot about elderberries, because this is March, and, and what do we need to be doing this spring, and just a little bit about elderberries. Well, by March, a lot of them have broken bud. So elderberries break bud in February. They're oh very goodness. early to break bud. They're very freeze resistant. So they kind of break bud and they're kind of sitting there. You can see some new growth already coming mm -hmm. up. So we're, there's not a whole lot to do. We don't want to disturb them when they're breaking bud like this. Cold freeze isn't going to bother them. So, but you can, if you look around, there's already annual weeds. that Those may need to be dealt with. They'll flower in June. So until flowering, it's just kind of we will fertilize probably in April. Just kind of take good care of them. Okay, so and fertilizer, is, it's soil test based, of, of course, and when we do, do we just mark small fruit? So we're working on at University of Missouri getting a elderberry recommendation, but we don't quite have it yet, so we use blackberry or small fruit. Okay. So yeah, a soil test tells so much, phosphorus, potassium, and pH. The nitrogen you're going to want, want to add every year, like with most any crop. So, okay. but this was all, this is a planting here that was all tested before we started and balanced the phosphorus, potassium, and these were just planted last summer. Okay, so they've grown quite a bit. Yes. How, how large were they when you started? A little cutting. Oh my goodness, so, so we, one year to get this big. Yes, we start with like here's, there's a little cutting that would be about four to six inches tall uh -huh. that we root and then we planted in May and then some of this has really grown since then. Wow. Now, would they bloom that very first year? Some do, but we encourage you to remove the, the flowers the first year because you want roots and strength rather than flowers and fruit the first year. So this is now the second year we will encourage full, full production. Okay. So, but now you told me before we started that if you're a commercial grower, it's almost a little too late to, to, to do your plantings. This is March 14th, I think. Uh -huh. So, yeah, they should be in the ground by now. Or there, there's kind of a long story there, Tim. But if you're if you're planting greenhouse rooted plants, they need to go in after frost, which would be May 1st. Okay. But anything like this that's going in dormant needs to be in the ground. The sooner, the better. There, there's more to that story. So if I got cuttings and just slips. I should have planted those a, a month ago. Yes, <clears throat> yes. But like me, I want to start some more elderberries and mine will have to be after May 1st. If you buy from a nursery that are already rooted yes. or leafed out because that, even though elderberry is very freeze tolerant, at that point they're coming from a greenhouse and need to be frost free. Okay. So does that kind of make sense? Sure, yeah. sure. And those may or may not bloom that first year. Just to... Again, I would remove any flowers okay. the first year. So this second year, we should have a good crop, but by the third year, a full crop. So I would, I would not remove any fruit this year. So in three years, we have a full crop? Even two years. Wow. If you get them in the ground early by cuttings or by May 1st mm -hmm. from a greenhouse, you should have, I, I would expect a pretty good crop on this this year, the second year. It's a lot different than blueberries. Apples take five years. Grapes take five years. So elderberry, you're in business. The second year, really. Now, I see, of course, elderberries growing wild along the road, mm -hmm. but we've got improved varieties, yes. but they've been selected. In, is, is that, is, they haven't been bred so much as selected. Right. So, good question. So, we, we have an active elderberry breeding program going on now. Okay. Uh, Liz Pranger at University of Missouri and Dr. Ron Revord are our mm -hmm. breeders. But you gotta wait a few years, so this is gonna take a while. So the best we have now are wild selections, mm -hmm. but they showed promise in the wild. We brought them in to the university setting and did quite a bit of testing several years, and then once they're proven and they seem to be superior, then we kind of release them to the public. An example is the Pocahontas variety mm -hmm. that <clears throat> came from Pocahontas, Arkansas. Oh. We, right off the bat, we, it looked fantastic. It has huge, what we call signs. These are the fruiting structure. 
and it continued to look good, continued to look good, so we moved it into a larger trial, and then it continued to look good, so now it's actually been released Open, and <clears throat> published as a cultivar. Okay. But to answer your question, it's a wild selection. It's not a result of breeding. We hope that <clears throat> uh, Liz and Ron then, for example, if we harvest fruit from the Pocahontas from one of these orchards, we can assume the pollen came from another improved variety. So we're just letting Mother Nature do the cross-pollinating and then we'll be we're planting out these seeds and seedlings and we'll be looking for superior varieties. So those will then be from a breeding program. But Pocahontas are all clones then? Correct. Vegetative or asexual That's clones. why we always propagate from cuttings, anything like that. What I'm talking about, the breeding, then we would go through seed mm -hmm. And then we would evaluate those, and if we find a couple superior ones, then we go back to cuttings. Sure. So they have to be kept. Your, your cloning is exactly right. Okay, yeah. great, great. Now, other than Pocahontas, it, there's a couple more in there that's... There's four uh, <clears throat> that have been released. So Bob Gordon is the first or second one. Uh -huh. First one, I think, is from Osceola, Missouri. The Wildwood uh, came from Oklahoma. And the one called Marge is kind of complicated. It's a European elderberry that has kind of an interesting story. We don't do much work at all on European elderberry, but that one we released because it's very unusual and it grows well in Missouri, where most European elderberry does not grow well here. Now, aren't the European elderberries big in the flowers? Or, or, in, or am I mistaken mm -hmm. on that? The size, they're not really any bigger. Okay, okay. But the, so, it's just a very different plant, okay. and it just doesn't grow that well in Missouri. We've grown many varieties, and they usually eventually die. Mm. They just don't like it here, and there's a whole thought process on that. So we really are focusing on the American elderberry. Okay. So how long will the elderberries live then? What's that getting We don't know, but I would expect 15 years. By 12 or 15 years, you're probably going to be seeing decline and we per, perennial weeds mm -hmm. and maybe some disease, but we don't know. Okay. So, you know, blackberry by 10 or 15 years, it's time to rotate out. Even peach trees, mm -hmm. 15 years, it's time. So that's kind of our thought process is, you know, blueberries can go 50 years, grapes 50 years, but probably elderberry, it's going to be time to, to rotate and replant. Right, we think. Great. And how tall will they eventually get then? Well, in Missouri, in this part of the Ozarks, we have very poor soil. So these may get as tall as me. Mm -hmm. They may get a little taller. If you up at the Hark Farm, we have a different and better soil. They can get 12 feet tall. Oh. Uh, we have some in the further south that are being grown organically that get 12, 15 feet tall. The exact same variety. Like Pocahontas here will get so tall, Pocahontas in a different soil, a different site can get much taller. So it's very responsive to its environment and to its management. It's which very can, interesting. Which can really inhibit a harvest, though, too, can, if, if they're 12 foot tall. We don't really want them that tall. Right. You're right. right. So a new varieties that hopefully get developed then could be, maybe they'll get more than five foot tall, for example. But these are all great questions. So yeah, so we're working on mechanical harvest as yes. well with, with an engineering uh, professor. So. You can develop the technology, but you also need to grow and breed the plant to be amenable to mechanical mm -hmm. harvest. So you're exactly right. Maybe eight feet is too tall, or maybe four feet is too short to, you know, for this machine. So th these are great points mm -hmm. that this is a very primitive crop that we're <clears throat> working on these aspects. And it was nice, it's a native to Missouri and, and the surrounding states. Yeah, elderberry is native all the way from Canada to Florida, uh, even oh. into Texas, into Mexico. So it, it doesn't go much across the Rockies to the west. There are other species of elderberry there, but it's, so it's a very, very widespread plant. And it grows way up in Quebec, where it's really 40 below zero. They'll, they'll, they're native up there as well. And they, but probably for Missouri, those would, would be different maturity, wouldn't they? They would probably mature differently based on the wow. day length. So in this planting that we're standing in is to address that question. Uh -huh. So these are selections. We have 12 selections of elderberry from Florida, Oklahoma, Missouri, up to Minnesota, Iowa, 
and they're planted in five locations. This is one of the five locations, so we're trying to answer that question. So I, I don't know if you can see, but there's a, a couple in here that the tops have died. Well, mm. those are the ones from Florida, oh. but the plant is alive and will come back. And we've noticed like the ones from Minnesota. So here, they're, they're from a really cold climate, mm. and here they are in Missouri. <clears throat> they have broken bud earlier because they think it's spring and they're yeah. ready to go. So those, they're all American elderberry, the same exact species, but there are genetic differences in them. And they, over eons, have, have developed adaptations to growing in Florida versus Minnesota. So that's exactly what this study that we're in oh, is, is trying to address. That'd be great. And any of the cultural uh, things that we need to look at if, if we're growing them either like in our, in our gardens or do we need to pay attention to, I, I guess, Mulch is is important, mm -hmm. and so it, it's a difference if you're if you want a few plants in your garden mm -hmm. versus commercial production. But weeds are a very important concern because elderberry is a multiple stem shrub. <clears throat> so this you can see is growing in a fabric with holes burned in mm -hmm. it. So we shouldn't have much weed problem. But mulch, anything like that, if you have them in a home garden, you're going to want to mulch and okay. re reduce the weeds. So weeds and then the other big problem are spotted wing drosophila, which is a very small mm. fruit fly that is very active when these fruit are ripe in August. So depending on if you have them, you may have to intervene. There's organic methods to intervene if you need to, and otherwise there's commercial conventional okay. methods for, so those, uh, those are probably the two most important. They're, they're pretty easy to grow. They're a native plant, they're pretty tough, uh, but the weeds in the spotted wing fruit fly okay. probably the more most challenging. And the spotted wing fruit fly, that's in all of our brambles. Right. Type, like it's berries. everywhere in Missouri yes. now, yeah. So. Unfortunately, all right. Yeah. And of course, the health benefits for <clears throat> elderberry have, have been well documented. Yes, so I'm not a doctor, but I, I read a lot and I, I have my elderberry gummies <laughs> uh, from River Hills Harvest. Uh, super high antioxidants, the flowers are, are proven. There's scientific evidence as, as an antiviral. They work well against flu. Um, some of the research at University of Missouri has been in brain health. So we have a paper uh, published uh, several years ago now that showed it was, this was with mice and <clears throat> that uh, mice that had taken a modest diet of elderberry versus mice that didn't had less damage from stroke and recovered faster and better from stroke. And there were differences in the brain. Now uh, we are looking at the aging brain. So because of that work on the brain, elderberry seems extremely beneficial to the brain. We have a study that's starting like right now with uh, not Alzheimer's particularly, but memory loss and dementia. And so we're using older mice and then that's amazing, the research capabilities at University of Missouri to do this. So this is ongoing and pretty exciting. It is. Yeah. And that's that wonderful marriage that we have at the University of Missouri of agriculture and medicine. Well, sure. That we can put those two together for human health. Well, we have that at Mizzou that we, ha you know, I work with biochemists and some of the people on our team are MD, PhD. Oh, wonderful. You know, professors working on mice and brain health work with the engineers, food scientists, mm -hmm. economists, it, it's great. All of that kind of comes together in elderberry. Wow, that is, that, that, that is fantastic. That's pretty fun. It yeah. is. We do have a website for our project. Oh. So there, the, this, uh, we have a large grant from the uh, USDA Specialty Crop Research Initiative. And the website is elderberry.missouri.edu. Okay. So it's a beautiful website that kind of summarizes a lot of the ongoing work at University of Missouri. And we have other partners, so uh, let us know. All right, we will. Oh, one last question. Mm -hmm. Are they very drought tolerant? No. Okay, so, we, so, so that's why we see them in ditches, I suppose. They, they, they don't like standing water, but you'll, often you'll see them on the upside of a ditch. Uh -huh. so, they, so they have access to water. So any commercial production without irrigation is a mistake. Okay. You have to have irrigation because keep in mind, we harvest these in August. How hot is it in August? Mm -hmm. 100 degrees. And do we want elderberry raisins or do we want juice? Mm. 
We want juicy berries, so they need lots of water, and that's when you really need to pour on the water in August. Oh, really? Because that's when we often have a periodic drought. Even if it's not a severe drought, a couple weeks of drought when you're harvesting, you can easily lose half your yield with just water. Wow. You know, and juice. So, so that last few weeks of, of, yeah. of their, probably once they start blooming, then we need to start paying attention to the water. They, they love water. Okay. <clears throat> you know, not too much, but especially during establishment, especially during fruit harvest. Uh -huh. uh, they're, they're not a drought tolerant species. So. All right, all right. Well, anything else, Andy? It's been great. Thanks, Tim. Well, Appreciate thank you. It, yeah.